Okay, so over here we have some more cases of pegmatite, which once again is a kind of granite. And one thing you can do with igneous rocks is you can tell how slow they cool. And the way you tell how slow they cooled is by the size of their crystals. If rock cools from liquid rock really fast, the crystals don't have a chance to form. But if it cools slowly, then crystals can have a lot of time to form. The minerals that come together that make the crystals will actually form very large crystals. And so in these rocks, there are some very large black crystals and quartz crystals and mica crystals and feldspar crystals that have formed in this pegmatite. That's one of the distinct characteristics of pegmatite. Pegmatite is sometimes a place where people go to find semi-precious jewels. In Maine, there are actually pegmatite quarries where people go hunting for emeralds and other rare gems. So, we're going to now move on to the South Garden of the Greenfield Community Rock, College Rock Garden. And I just remind you, for each of the garden sections, there is a guide with pictures in the wooden box that I showed you in the beginning of this video. Okay, Mr. Wheat tells me that I've been yelling, so I'm going to talk a little softer. Yeah, uh, what I want to bring your attention to now is that you are now standing in the South Garden of the Greenfield Community College Rock Garden. Um, it contains extrusive igneous rock. And if you remember from our studies of the rock cycle, extrusive igneous rock means that it's external to the Earth's interior, which means it came from lava flows. Magma's underground, lava's above ground, and when lava flows on the top surface of the Earth, well, it's cooler than underground, so it cools into rock pretty quickly. And most of this rock is basalt. Over here, we have some samples of what look like pillow basalt and maybe some lava bombs as well. Uh, the pillow basalt is the basalt from lava flows that flows underwater. If you go to Turner's Falls, you should be able to find some pillow basalt there in the lava flows. Uh, lava bombs are, of course, big blobs of lava that got thrown somewhere. But these look to me very much like pillow basalt. I would recommend you take a look at the rock guide that the uh, Four Rivers charts will put together to find out about that. We also have more massive uh, basalt here as well uh, with various modelings and different colors in it from different minerals. We have some vesicular basalt which means it has little vessels or little bubbles because this is when the lava came to the surface full of dissolved gases under a lot of pressure. And just like a soda can that you shake up and open up it fizzes. This lava fizzed when it came to the surface of the earth and then those bubbles froze 200 million years ago and were set in stone. Now particular interest over here, and this is a rock that we are going to treat as the do not touch rock. Because if you remember, we have told you that fossils really only form in sedimentary rock. There are exceptions. Every once in a while, something gets run over by a lava flow and doesn't get completely burned up. And in this rock, right here, the little tiny fork is a little bit of a piece of a tree that's been turned into charcoal and preserved in the lava rock. There's a couple of good examples of the American Museum of Natural History in New York as well in the Hall of the Earth. But this is a particularly rare fossil that you can find in an igneous rock. You can also sometimes find fossils that were in limestone that get preserved even after that limestone turns into marble, which is the metamorphic form of the sedimentary rock of limestone. But So there are exceptions. Very unusual for you to find a fossil in non-sedimentary rock. But remember, don't touch. This is precious and very fragile. I'm going to walk over here to the columnar basalt. Now this is really massive columnar basalt. When lava flows cool uh, in certain ways and there are certain depths, uh, the, the temperature the temperatures the, will flow through them in a circular fashion and it will actually start to contract in a circular direction. If you remember in sixth grade math, circles don't tessellate. And so the easiest thing to get to tessellate 
is a hexagon, just like a beehive's hexagonal little cells. The lava will form hexagonal type shaped cells. They're not perfect hexagons in this case, but sometimes you'll find almost perfect ones. This one right here is another example of it. These were probably from Mount Tom, uh, which some of you will be certainly going to. Now, if we'll walk over here, we find, of course, more of the uh, lava pillows, the pillow basalt, but this is a really neat specimen because this has been polished and scraped by the glaciers. So this, way after this lava flow happened around 200 million years ago, you keep hearing me say 200 million years ago because that's when the lava flows were happening in this area. More recently, between 2 million and 20,000 years ago, this whole area was covered with ice and glaciers were polishing rocks and this one got scraped, polished, and then it dragged rocks along it. You can see what are called glacial striations, which is like as if the glacier had claws and dragged them across the rock and left scratch marks. On this side, Mr. Reed, you'll come around, this rock also contains an old slick inside, as does this one. This one's particularly spectacular. So come on around and take a look at the slick inside. And an even more amazing one over here. The slick inside. You might have found the slick inside over at Turner's Falls, but these are amazing slick insides. When an earthquake fault moves two massive amounts of rock against each other, sometimes the pressure is so great that the friction will actually melt the rock into a glassy sheen. And it'll actually, an earthquake can turn rock into glass. Now over time, that glass erodes away, minerals find themselves crystallizing in it, and it breaks down the glassy sheen. But you can get this sort of thing. Also, minerals will find their way in through groundwater and will crystallize along the surface of it like that. That's either a calcite or a quartz. I would have to use some hydrochloric acid to find out, and I'm not going to do that to this rock garden. Over here, though, we have volcanic breccia. At Barton Cove you had sedimentary breccia. Now when sedimentary rock gets jumbled up and broken up and then reforms as a rock in a jumbled pile of broken layers, that's called sedimentary breccia. When volcanic rock is subjected to explosive or earthquake kind of forces, it will also sometimes break up. And the broken parts then will often get filled in with crystals. You might have seen some rocks in Mr. Wheat's room or my room that were filled with granite crystals, the various crystals that are formed of granite. This got filled in with either quartz or calcite crystals. Once again, I'm not sure because I'm not going to put some hydrochloric acid on the rocks in the rock garden. But take a look around. This is the south garden. Once again, the south garden is devoted to extrusive or surface level volcanic rocks formed from lava. The central garden is devoted to intrusive uh, igneous rocks, which are igneous rocks that are formed from magma underground. And the, south, and the north garden, I'm sorry, the north garden is devoted to sedimentary and metamorphic rocks from the Connecticut River region. Make sure you use the rock garden chart that was form, put together by the Four Rivers Charter School, another expeditionary learning school. Thank you.